I talk a lot about technologies to reduce emissions on this channel. Wind power to generate electricity without emissions, batteries to store that electricity for times when it's not windy, and say green steel making processes to reduce emissions from industry. But all those technologies taken together will only take us towards zero emission. There are some sectors like agriculture that are going to be extremely hard to completely eliminate emissions from. And even assuming we did actually eliminate all sources of emissions, we'd already have warmed our planet considerably from the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere. It sure would be nice to have a way to remove greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere, wouldn't it? I know from previous experience that when I talk about technologies to remove emissions from the atmosphere, someone clever will pipe up in the comments yeah, we already have that and it's called a tree. So in this video, we're going to look at nation's emissions reduction technology, trees. We're going to see whether that is actually the simple solution that so many people think it is. And spoiler alert, it's not enough. It's called bioenergy with carbon capture, AKA BEX. It's a technology thought by many to be our savior and by many others hated with a passion. What elicits such strong reactions? In this video, we'll find out how it works, where it's already been done and what it brings to the table that nature-based solutions like tree planting just doesn't. I'm Rosie Barnes. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. Plants naturally capture CO2 through the process of photosynthesis. Light, water and CO2 go in, oxygen comes out. The carbon absorbed through that process is then stored in the plant as sugars like glucose, and it stays there as long as the tree stays alive. This makes plants a natural carbon capture technology, achieving the same thing as direct air capture or many of the carbon capture and utilization technologies that I've covered on this channel before. And it does it in a nice, lush, natural way. So it's understandable that many are critical of the use of man-made carbon removal and storage technologies when we could instead rely on a natural method like tree planting. I love trees as much as the next greenie and I have been known to literally hug trees on occasion. I did vote in the recent and very important Australia's favorite tree poll. I chose a snow gum, which finished a respectable second place after the river red gum. Tree planting is going to play a role in addressing climate change and can have many benefits when it comes to land management. But I'm sorry to say it cannot be the only carbon capture technology we rely on. And now I am just briefly going to explain why. Forests, while essential in absorbing carbon, aren't a particularly secure storage method for carbon. The reason is that trees can only store it as long as they're alive. They are vulnerable to numerous threats, such as large scale fires, which can rapidly burn them down and release the stored CO2 back into the atmosphere. This challenge is becoming increasingly problematic, especially with the looming threat of global warming intensifying the risk of bushfires. Furthermore, mature forests operate under a relatively balanced carbon cycle. In these forests, the amount of carbon absorbed is nearly equivalent to the amount released through processes like organic matter decay. Old growth forests act as a great storage site for CO2, along with serving an important ecological role and being just generally lovely to spend time in. But they're no longer absorbing additional CO2 the way that younger forests are. To sequester more CO2 from forests, we need to be planting more and more trees. And here's where we run into a problem. A lot of the land we have on earth is either unsuitable for tree planting or occupied already by cities and farms. Estimates indicate that we have enough room for tree planting to sequester about 200 billion tons of CO2 over the next few decades. Now that's a lot, but over the course of human history, we've put around two and a half trillion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, over a hundred times the additional amount we think we could sequester from tree planting. As many trees as we could plant, it barely puts a dent in the CO2 that we've already put in the atmosphere. And there's another problem. That 200 billion ton figure might be overstating it, since further studies suggest that areas marked as available for tree planting are productive grassland and savanna biomes, home to species that don't want to live in forests. Also, there have been recent suggestions that the amount of carbon stored in such ecosystems has been underestimated before now. There may be far more carbon stored in soils in these areas, and some have even gone so far as to suggest that replacing these ecosystems with forests could actually result in an addition of CO2 into the atmosphere. That would mean that some of the 200 billion tons worth of tree planting could actually be counterproductive. Of course, there's a lot of different ways to use land and the ways in which we do can make a big difference in how much space we have left for tree planting. So this includes things like we could build cities that are less sprawling and more concentrated, as well as changing in farming. In particular, switching to diets with less meat could drastically reduce the amount of space left for other activities. Agricultural land makes up about 38% of Earth's land and animal grazing or growing feed for those animals takes up the vast majority of that farmland. While it only contributes 
contributes about 15% of our calories. So if we switch to diets that minimize meat and especially beef, that could leave a lot more land that could be used to help with climate change, whether that's growing trees or bioenergy. But even that doesn't change the fact that there isn't nearly enough space on the earth for trees to store all the CO2 that we've added to the atmosphere. If we want to not only lower emissions, but return the atmosphere closer to its pre-industrial state, we're going to need technologies that can permanently trap more CO2 than all of the trees that we can fit on all of the earth. And that's where BEX can help. The issue of how to remove CO2 from the atmosphere is one of the hardest in the energy transition. But if we don't manage to figure it out, we are looking at a much higher temperature increase than the 1.5 degrees countries agreed to aim for in the Paris Agreement. As someone who's deeply invested in the world of renewable energy and worries whether we're acting fast enough, I sometimes find myself overwhelmed by issues like these, what's commonly referred to as climate anxiety. The weight of our global situation, together with everyday stresses from combining work and family and a YouTube channel, often has me searching for answers and not necessarily focused on what I should be in that moment. This is where the sponsor of today's video, Aura Health, comes in. There's no one-size-fits-all solution to mental well-being, and Aura understands that. They've created an all-in-one wellness app that adapts and learns how to best cater to your personal needs. One of the things I really like about Aura is that no matter how tight my schedule is, there's always a meditation or exercise tailored to the time I have available. Be it a quick five minutes of mindfulness to regain focus at work or a longer meditation after a hectic day of filming, Aura's got me covered. And while I began using Aura to help ease climate anxiety and stress, I've also found benefits to my overall well-being and sleep. A huge thank you to Aura for supporting my mental health and for supporting this video. If you're struggling with anything similar, I recommend giving Aura a try. Start for free at aurahealth.io slash Rosie or click the link in the description. Beck starts with the same idea as tree planting. Plants absorb carbon from the atmosphere, but then it takes things a step further and we use the stored energy for our own purposes and permanently store the carbon they held instead of releasing it back into the atmosphere. So let's walk through all of the steps needed in a bit more detail. To start, we grow the biomass. A huge variety of plants can be used for this, ranging from trees to crops like corn to agricultural waste crops. Once we have our biomass, there's a few different ways to get the energy out of it, and by far the most common one is simply to burn it. Before burning though, biomass is typically processed to make it easier to use as fuel. The type of processing depends on the type of biomass being used. Wood, for instance, is usually dried to remove moisture from the fiber, then it's ground into dust and then compressed into small cylinders called wood pellets. Crops like corn can be fermented into bioethanol. Another method is trophication, where biomass is heated to temperatures of around 200 to 320 degrees Celsius to dry it out. Torrified biomass is much easier to store and to use as fuel as it repels water, and it loses about 20% of its original volume while retaining 90% of the original energy. After processing, the biomass can then be burned for its energy to do productive things like create electricity via a steam turbine. When the biomass is burnt, the carbon it previously held is released again. If it's allowed to go into the atmosphere at this point, then that's just regular bioenergy. That process can be emissions neutral or close to it, since the CO2 released upon combustion was already absorbed through photosynthesis. And then in BEX, instead of just letting the emissions go into the atmosphere, we can install carbon capture technology. If you want the details on how carbon capture actually works, and in fact, if it works, then you can check out this video I made on that a couple of years back. And then after capturing the carbon, if we went on to store the CO2 underground, then we could end up with less CO2 in the atmosphere compared to when we started. That is, it could be carbon negative. And I use the word could because even though superficially the carbon balance of photosynthesis, burning, capture ends up negative, there will be added emissions every step of the way during transport and processing and due to inefficiencies in the carbon capture and storage. So its carbon negative status is a possibility, not an inevitability. More on that later though. So here's what Bex brings to the table that tree planting doesn't. Tree planting allows a piece of land to sequester carbon for a few decades while the forest is growing. And then after that, the best it can do is to continue to store that carbon in trees. That, by the way, can at any moment burn down in a fire. On the other hand, Bex could allow that same piece of land to continue to pull carbon out of the atmosphere indefinitely into the future and store it forever where it won't contribute to climate change for the foreseeable future. This has already been done at a relatively small scale. About 2 million tonnes of carbon dioxide is captured and stored using Bex every year right now, but interest in the technology is increasing dramatically. 
Based on projects that are planned or currently in development, that number could reach 40 million tonnes by 2030, which is not insignificant. For comparison, it's about the same as what Finland emitted last year. About 90% of current BEX projects are at bioethanol facilities, which is one of the easiest places to apply CCS due to the high concentration of CO2 in the waste stream. The biggest BEX plant in the world currently operating, responsible for nearly half of all emissions captured this way, is the Illinois Industrial CCS project. It came online in 2018 and captures CO2 emissions from corn to ethanol fermentation and then stores it two kilometres underground in sandstone. The biggest bioenergy plant in the world, Drax in the UK, has also begun piloting CCS. The amount captured is currently very small, but there are plans to scale up over time. There's a few other big benefits that BEX brings that tree planting can't. One is that we can measure how much CO2 we're storing underground much more accurately than we can measure the CO2 stored by trees. This might sound like a small point, but the accounting side of climate change is really important for setting up emissions pricing and regulation schemes. Getting to net zero is going to mean finding solutions to extremely hard to abate emissions like cement production, which by the way, I just recently made a video on the technologies available to do just that. In the event that zero emissions cement and agriculture and every single other hard to abate sector doesn't get a zero emissions solution in time, BEX or another negative emissions technology could help in getting to net zero. And knowing how much exactly is getting captured and stored will be critical to that. There's also the advantage that bioenergy is, well, energy and it's a storable form of energy. It will probably be much easier to let a pile of wood pellets build up over summer to burn in the winter than it will be to find seasonal storage solutions for excess solar power generated in summer for places that need that kind of storage. So using a lot of BEX in a grid that previously relied on coal can help clean up that part of the electricity generation while still maintaining some of the convenient aspects of coal power. That's in contrast to other negative emissions technologies that consume energy. Since both BEX and coal power plants are based on combustion, converting a coal plant to a bioenergy plant is a possibility. Adding in carbon capture and storage is not cheap, of course, especially if you try and retrofit it after the original plant was built, but it's at least a possibility. And in fact, the Drax plant in the UK, remember the biggest bioenergy plant in the world, it was originally a coal plant that is now talking about adding carbon capture. So that all sounds amazing, and I've probably given the impression that I am a huge fan of BEX as a major contributor to our future energy system. Well, in fact, I'm not, because while the broad overview of BEX is amazing, as you zoom in and start to think details, it gets harder and harder to see how it can scale without causing problems potentially worse than what it's solving. So I said earlier that BEX could be carbon negative, but it's definitely not always carbon negative. Bioenergy might be carbon neutral on a small scale. If you chop up a fallen tree with an ax and then walk it back to your home to burn, yeah, that's carbon neutral in the long term. But in the short term, you've brought forward carbon release to today that might otherwise have stayed stored for decades or longer. And if you try to scale it up to an amount that can put a dent in atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, you're not going to be gathering fallen wood anymore. Emissions are going to be added along the supply chain due to processing and transportation, messing up your CO2 balance sheet to some extent. Transport emissions are common to pretty much all large-scale bioenergy plants. 80% of the wood used in UK Drax plant is imported from North America, and all bioenergy used in the Japanese Mikawa bioenergy plant is imported from Indonesia. Additionally, most biorefineries operate using fossil fuels for things like heat, adding emissions in the processing of many biofuels today. The type of crop that's used also matters a lot. If you use waze, which includes things like corn and wheat husks, that's extremely sustainable as they would otherwise just be discarded. So using them is really just getting more use out of already productive land. By contrast, something like palm oil is closely linked to deforestation in Indonesia. Even if all that palm oil ends up at a vex plant, the jungle cut down to make way for the plantation may not, which can increase emissions in the short term, to say nothing of the ecological damage caused by destroying an orangutan habitat. And that's a case when we know where the bioenergy is coming from. There have been other cases of bioenergy producers using some more creative communication on supply chains. Waste wood is typically thought of as wood from old houses or broken furniture at the end of its life cycle or residuals from other timber uses that can be used as bioenergy. But a number of biomass producers have been found to be using whole trees and labeling them as waste wood. I go into more detail about these ugly aspects in a video I did a while back on bioenergy if you wanna check that out. So in summary, the devil's in the details. BEC can play an important role in addressing climate change, but policies that encourage bioenergy but don't carefully control how that's done will lead to negative impacts on biodiversity, human quality of life, and could even worsen climate change. 
That said, although I've raised a bunch of reasons why I think that scaling bioenergy is problematic, it's one of only a very short list of negative emissions technologies that have the possibility to be scaled to the amount that we'll need. And its price and energy usage is pretty competitive among the alternatives. That's why major institutions who have created net zero scenarios like the International Energy Agency and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change believe that it'll be essential in getting to net zero by 2050. Negative emissions in general, and BEX specifically, are kind of a least worst kind of solution, and that's probably about the best that I can say for them. Thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team for supporting this and every video I make. If you'd like to join us and help get Engineering with Rosie to a once per week release schedule, and join in our community of energy nerds on the exclusive Engineering with Rosie Discord server, then you can join at this link. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.